Hatred is Never Equal by Duncan Donatu. Sylvia had on her black shoes. They were shiny new. Her hair was perfectly parted in two long trenzas. It was her first day at the Westminster School. The halls were crowded with students. She was looking for her locker when a young white boy pointed at her and yelled, Go back to the Mexican school. You don't belong here. For the rest of the day, Sylvia did not speak or introduce herself in her classes. She kept her head down while walking in the halls. When she got home that afternoon, she told her mom, Felicitas, what had happened? I don't want to go to that school anymore. The kids are mean. Sylvia, said her mother, no sabes que por eso luchamos? Don't you know that that is why we fought? Three years earlier, in the summer of 1944, Sylvia and her brothers, Jerome and Gonzalo Jr., and their parents had moved from the crowded city of Santa Ana, California, to a farm in nearby Westminster. Her father, Gonzalo Mendez, had labored for years as a field worker, picking grapes and oranges. Now, he was leasing, leasing a farm. He was going to be the boss. On their new farm, they were going to grow asparagus, chilies, and tomatoes. As the summer came to an end and the first day of school neared, Aunt Soledad drove Sylvia and her brothers and their cousins, Alice and Virginia, to the local public school on 17th Street so they could enroll. Sylvia was going to enter third grade, Gonzalo was going to enter second, and Jerome first. What a handsome building, thought Sylvia as they pulled into the parking lot. Tall trees lined the street in front of the school. There was a playground with monkey bars and a red swing. When they walked into the school, they noticed that the hallways were spacious and clean. I'm here to enroll the children in school, said Aunt Soledad when they arrived at the principal's office. The secretary gave Aunt Soledad two enrollment forms one for Alice and one for Virginia, but she did not give her enrollment forms for Sylvia and her brothers. They cannot attend the school, said the secretary. They must go to the Mexican school. Why do I have to go to the Mexican school? Sylvia wondered. She was not Mexican, she was American. She spoke perfect English. Her father was from Mexico, but he had become a US citizen. Her mother was from Puerto Rico, which was a US territory. Aunt Soledad was upset, but we all live in this part of town. Silvia looked at her cousins. They had light skin and long auburn hair, and their name was Vidauri. Their father was Mexican, but out of fresh descent. Then she looked at her brothers and at her own hands and bare arms. She wondered, is it because we have brown skin and thick black hair and our last name is Mendez? Rules are rules, said the secretary. The Mendes children have to go to the Mexican school. I will not be enrolling any of them then, said Aunt Soledad, and she stormed out of the office, taking Silvia and the other children with her. When they arrived home, Aunt Soledad told Silvia's father what had happened. Mr. Mendes told her not to worry. It had to be a mistake. He would take care of it. He was a businessman, and he was used to dealing with people. The next day, Mr. Mendes met with Mr. Harris, the superintendent of the Westminster School. Mr. Mendes explained that his family had just moved to a nearby farm. The public school on 17th Street is the closest school to our house, and my children should attend it. Your children have to go to the Mexican school, said Mr. Harris. But why, asked Mr. Mendes. He was not given an answer other than, that is how it's done. In the following days, Mr. Mendes met with Mr. Atkinson the county superintendent, Mr. Harris's superior, and then with the school board, which oversaw all of the schools in Orange County. But they all said the same thing. Your children have to go to the Mexican school. But why, Mr. Mendes kept asking, no one would give him a satisfactory answer. That fall, Sylvia and her brothers had to attend Hoover Elementary, better known as the Mexican school, on Olive Street in the city of Westminster. The building was a clapboard shack, and the halls were not spacious or clean. A cow pasture surrounded the school. 
The students had to eat their lunch outside and flies would land on their food. There was an electric wire that surrounded the pasture to keep the cows in. If you touched it, you received a shock. The school did not have a playground, not even a swing. The Mendes family did not give up. Time and time again, Sylvia heard her father talk with coworkers, friends, and other parents. It's not fair that our kids have to go to an inferior school, he said. It's only a it's not only the building that's a problem. The teachers at the school don't care about our children's education. They expect them to drop out by the eighth grade. How will our children succeed and become doctors, lawyers, or teachers? Mr. Mendes created a group called the Parents Association of Mexican American Children. He tried to collect signatures for a petition to integrate schools so that all children, regardless of their skin color or background, could have the same opportunities. But every time he asked someone to sign the petition, he would get the same answer. No queremos problemas. We don't want any problems. Many of the parents worked on farms owned by white families and feared they would lose their jobs if they supported the petition. One day, a truck driver overheard Mr. Mendes trying to convince a worker to sign his petition. You know, said the truck driver, you could file a lawsuit. The truck driver told Mr. Mendes about a lawyer named David Marcus, who had filed a lawsuit on behalf of people in San Bernardino and had helped them integrate the public pools there. At that time, not only were schools segregated, but also other public places as well, such as pools, parks, and movie theaters. Some businesses even had signs that read, no dogs or Mexicans allowed. Mr. Mendes decided right then and there to hire Mr. Marcus, even if it meant having to spend all of his savings to do so. Over the next few months, Mr. Mendes and Mr. Marcus traveled all over Orange County, looking for people who had experienced similar problems. Sylvia watched her father leave early in the morning. Sometimes she saw him come home in the evening, but often she only heard his footsteps when he gone in late at night. While he was away, Sylvia's mother had to take care of the farm. Mrs. Mendes would get Sylvia and her brothers ready for school, and then she would go out to the fields. She started the irrigation system, drove the tractor, oversaw the workers, and solved any problems that arose. While with the help of Mr. Marcus, Mr. Mendes found and talked with other families who were dealing with segregation. One of them was the Estrada family. Mr. Estrada had fought in World War II. He had risked his life next to Americans of all races and backgrounds. But when he returned to America from the war, he found out that his children were not allowed to attend school with white children. Es una injusticia, said Mr. Mendes. It's an injustice. The Estrada family joined the Mendes case, and so did three more families. The families were from different school districts in Orange County. Westminster, where Sylvia lived, Garden Grove, El Modena, and Santa Ana. Mr. Marcus wanted to show that segregation, that segregation of students affected not only Sylvia and her brothers, but more than 5,000 children in the public school system all over Orange County. On March 2nd, 1945, Mr. Marcus went to the courthouse and filed the lawsuit. The trial was held at a courthouse in Los Angeles. Sylvia and her family dressed in their best clothes and sat in the courtroom to listen. The hearing lasted five days. Each day, Mr. Marcus called to the stand parents from the different districts in Orange County and the superintendents from each district too. On the first day, Mr. Kent, the superintendent of the Garden Grove district was questioned. He said that he sent children to the Mexican school to help them improve their English. That is a lie, thought Sylvia. Her English was as good as the English of any of the children at the Westminster school. Do you give the children any test? Asked Mr. Marcus. Mr. Kent claimed he did. We do so by talking to them. That is another lie, Sylvia wanted to yell. No one had questioned her. They rejected her from the Westminster school without asking her a thing. For what other reasons do you send children to the Mexican school? Asked Mr. Marcus. Sylvia and her family braced themselves to hear what Mr. Kent would say next. For their social behavior, they need to learn cleanliness of mind, manner, and dress. They are not learning that at home. They have problems with lice, impedigo, and tuberculosis. They have generally dirty hands, face, neck, and ears. The Mendes family and others in the room stared at Mr. Kent in disbelief. What he was saying was not true. It was degrading. 
How many of the 292 children at the Mexican school are inferior to whites in personal hygiene? Asked Mr. Marcus. At least 75%. And in their scholastic ability? 75%. In what other respects are they inferior? In their economic outlook and their clothing and in their ability to take part in the activities of the school. Do you believe that white students are superior to Mexicans in the respects that you have mentioned? Yes. And is that one of the reasons they're being segregated? Yes. Time and again, Mr. Mendez had asked, why can't my children attend the Westminster School? Now he had his answer. On the second day, Mr. Marcus called to the stand a 14-year-old student from the Mexican school in El Modena. Her name was Carol Torres. She spoke perfect English. It was clear that she had not been sent to the Mexican school because she had problems speaking the language, as the defense lawyers claimed. Mr. and Mrs. Mendez were questioned on the third and fourth day, and so was Mr. Harris, the superintendent of the Westminster School. Sylvia was not called to the stand, but she was ready to testify if they asked her to. She tried looking her best every morning, and she practiced what she would answer. On the fifth and final day of the hearing, Mr. Marcus called to the stand two education specialists to explain why it was bad to segregate children into different schools. Segregation tends to give an aura of inferiority. In order to have the people of the United States understand one another, it is necessary for them to live together. And the public school is one mechanism where all of the children of all the people need to go, said one of them. The judge nodded his head. He seemed to agree with this. Judge Paul McCormick took almost a year to give his decision. But when he did, he ruled in favor of the Mendes family. In his ruling, he said that public education must be open to all children by Unified School Association, regardless of lineage. This meant that everyone must be allowed to attend school, no matter what his or her race or background. The Mendes victory made newspaper headlines. Silvia's family was ecstatic but they did not have much time to celebrate because the school board appealed the case. That is, it asked for another trial. Sylvia and her family had to go to the state court in San Francisco to argue the case again. In the new trial, the Mendez family received support from the League of United Latin American Citizens, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Japanese American Citizens League, the American Jewish Congress, and other organizations. These groups sent letters with information relevant to the case and asked the judge to rule in favor of the Mendes family. Silvia was amazed that people of different backgrounds and from different parts of the country who had never met her family were getting involved in the case and trying to help them. But her mother said, Cuando la causa es justa, los demás te siguen. When you fight for justice, others will follow. On April 15, 1947, the judges in the Court of Appeals in San Francisco ruled in favor of the Mendes family again. That June, Governor Earl Warren signed the law that said that all children in California were allowed to go to the school together, regardless of race, ethnicity, or language. So remember, said Silvia's mother, we fought to make sure you could attend a good school and have equal opportunities. Silvia thought long and hard about what her mother said. The next day, she returned to the Westminster School. This time, she did not listen to any whispers. She ignored the children who pointed at her and called her names, instead held her head high. Her parents had fought not only for her and her brothers, but for all their classmates. Looking around, she saw that other children were smiling at her. By the end of the day, she had made a friend. By the end of the school year, she had made many friends of different backgrounds. She knew that her family had fought for that. The end.